Sooner Nation, OU Insider subscribers, Coach Brian Clinton enthusiasts, people who don't know how to feel about OU football and either are experiencing what it was like to be a fan in the 90s or were fans in the 90s and are reliving horror flashbacks as we're two weeks away from Halloween. This is probably the podcast for you. This is another episode of the Oklahoma Drill, a podcast fueled by OU Insider and the Rivals Network. I am Jesse Crittenden, and I'm joined, as always, by someone who has something going well for them in their life, and that is evidenced by your Minnesota Vikings hat. Don't jinx it. Uh, knock on wood. I'm knocking on wood. <laughs> I'm knocking on wood because while your Vikings are the talk of the NFL, my Dallas Cowboys are getting absolutely wrecked at home game after game after game. But of course, the man I'm talking to, the man I'm talking about is Sir Coach Brian Clinton. Brian, how's it feel to have a NFL franchise that you're like proud of, that you're, that you're happy to be a fan of? Uh, it, it's nice for now. Um, yeah, uh, never seen him play for a Super Bowl, which I guess you, I mean, you, you may have, you were just really young. Don't, don't even, the Cowboys haven't made the NFC title game. It, it's been basically since I've been alive. I don't even want to hear well, that. Minnesota hasn't won a Super Bowl and it won an NFL championship since 69. So, I mean, it's a good year, but Hey, you know, but maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Sam Darnold's got it. I do. I will say, I know this is a football podcast, an Oklahoma football podcast, but I will say Kevin O'Connell, Brian Flores, like that duo is, it's mint. I, I hope, I really hope those two stick around for a while because I, I, I like it. You know what combination isn't mint? Jerry Jones and literally anything good in the known universe. Correct. Um, so I got to say, Brian, it's oddly fitting that the team I'm covering that I cover for a living, uh, mm -hmm. is something in shambles, something close to shambles. And the team I root for in the NFL is almost worse just because, I mean, they're three and three, but like not a good three and three. They're like right. the worst three and three you could ever be. And I know there are OU fans out there that are also Dallas Cowboys fans, so this weekend had to have been just tough, man. the double whammy of double whammies. Yeah. Thankfully, that's... hopefully, this is my advice to anybody that's a Dallas Cowboys fan out there. Let the Packers loss last year. Let that set your expectations. Because for me, that that game broke my soul. So the 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 devastating loss to the Lions kind of rolled like it kind of rolled off me. Who among us hasn't had their hearts broken by the Packers and or Lions? <laughs> I'm still well, mad at Aaron so, Rodgers. So the Packers, like. Anyways, uh, I'm still mad at Aaron Rodgers, and he doesn't even play for the I, Packers. I'm always anymore. mad at Aaron Rodgers. He like. Anyways, yeah, that's a whole that's a whole other thing. But I <laughs> sympathize greatly with OU and Dallas Cowboy fans because I know there's a lot of them. Um, and this weekend was probably the weekend from hell. In in a lot of ways, um, your two favorite teams lost by a combined. Can't do math. 30, 69, 69 points. Nice. That's yeah. the theme. That is the theme. Year 69, 69 total points. Good year, good number. Brian, we were trying to think about, look, we're, we're recording this pod on Wednesday afternoon, so we've not only had several days to wash um, OU Texas, to revisit OU Texas, to um, try to erase OU Texas, um, we've also had Brent Venable's press conference. Um, that was yesterday. Uh, we had player availability on Monday. So we've had several things that have kind of already happened and we're kind of recording after all of those things have happened. And, um, so we were talking about, I mean, what should the pod be? Because uh, OU fans are panicked and rightfully so. And it's, yeah. and it's not weird. It, it's kind of funny considering this team is still four and two with like, there's still a lot of ways that this season could go well, but I don't know yeah. how you I don't know how you watch that the Texas game or the offense this year and yeah. not be panicked. Yeah. So we were talking about what should we talk about? We were drive we were driving home from Dallas on Sunday talking about just the sad state of this offense and I think you and I both agreed let's just talk about the offense 
It doesn't need to be super structured. We've heard a lot from fans. Um, I, I did a part one of my mailbag. I published it this morning. A lot of people who wanted to talk about the offense issue their grievances about the offense. Mm-hmm. And so we're just going to talk about the offense. I, I don't think there's any real reason to talk about that much else. It's several days since the Texas game. Yep. Let's just, it, we now have a half season of work to evaluate this offense. So let's just talk about the offense. And the, and the first way that we should do that is some info that you're not going to get anywhere else. Anybody listening to this, you're not going to get it anywhere else. Cause Brian, you have done uh, a very good deep dive uh, and some very good research on a very specific part of OU's offense. And that is something that we're calling uh drive killing plays plays yeah. specifically on first downs. Um, because if you've watched OU football this year, you've noticed that if OU goes backwards, especially on first down, it just the eye test seems like they're doomed. If yep. this team can't stay on schedule, they're doomed. But you have gone through and actually kind of charted that more yeah. specifically. So um, you're going to have a lot of numbers and research in your story. It's going to publish on Friday or we're shooting for Friday. So mm-hmm. people should definitely go check that out. But Brian, from a there's a lot of data you've come through, but from a big picture sense. What is the biggest takeaway that you have found when you've gone through literally every drive this season and how and in the results of these drive killing plays? Well, the first thing is which this is just wild to me. Uh every time I look over at it, Oklahoma's offense through six games is suffering a drive killing play on first downs, just on first down, fifty four percent. Of the time, hey, real if quick, we, let's define let's define a drive killing play. Okay, so a drive quick. a drive killing play, which for the purpose of this is a first down play that results in negative yards, zero yards, a turnover, or a penalty that moves the offense backwards. So um, anything that negatively impacts the rest of the drive uh, from first down on that that play on first down is going to be your drive killing play or DKP in the in the story. Um, so 54% of their drives, um, 54.7 to be exact is how often you're seeing these drive killing plays for Oklahoma. Um, just on first down. Yeah. On first down. And that's that, and that's the biggest thing for this, uh, portion right now. And, And, you know, there's still some combing through to go through with some of the other downs. Um, but I mean, it's ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous how often Oklahoma is having to deal with negative plays. And what what I think really hurts the most about this data is is when you have first and ten, like there's 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 no pre- like it's probably not the best to say no pressure, but first and ten is your most wide open that your playbook is going to be like. You you can run anything on first and ten. That's uh, you're you're setting up the rest of the drive uh, on first and ten. But Oklahoma has gotten into a habit of creating second and twelves, first and fifteens, um, you know, second and ten, second and 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 twenty three. Like I mean, Oklahoma has just gotten in a really bad habit of putting themselves behind the chains. When you look at this, um. Through the first six games that had 75 drives total, 41 of those, as I as I just said, are, are negative plays on first down. 36 drives have ended in punts. So 48% of the time, they're punting the ball away. Uh, turnovers, which in this study uh, aren't just interceptions and, and fumbles. I'm considering missed field goal attempts, uh, turnover on downs, uh, you know, anything that's going to immediately give the football away. Uh, we've seen turnovers in, uh, on nearly 20% of the drives uh, total. And so it's just wild. I mean, it is absolutely wild how difficult. To, and, and what really hurts, Jesse, is when you remove Temple Houston and Tulane from the mix, it gets really bad. I mean, it gets really, really bad. Um, I mean, we can jump into that right now if you'd like. We can maybe maybe get some thoughts overall first from you. I'm I'm kind of interested to hear what you have to say. But the, uh, I mean, the first thing that jumps out to me is 
you're only scoring points on 32% of your drives right now if you're Oklahoma. Points, um, not touchdowns. Points, that's points. points. Yes, correct. Um, to me, it's just wild. I I, uh, I I have a hard time believing that. And and the other thing is through SEC, I mean, through SEC play, you've got four touchdown drives on offense. That's so, uh, that's so bad. Uh, you've got 15 touchdown drives through six games. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, that's so bad. Oh, I mean, my God. That's so I bad. Mean, it's, it, it's so bad. Yeah. I, I, that's What's that come out to? One and a half a game? One and a half touchdown drives a game? Anyways, yeah, it's, it's, it's really bad. Well, and so the purpose, and this was something that we had started talking about uh, on Sunday, and and this all comes, we wanted, I think we wanted to get specific, right? Because it's easy to say the offense is bad because the offense is bad, right? And and the right. most in the most broad of stats will tell you, like this is a team that ranks, and you have this in your story too. I think 125th in total offense, 96th in scoring offense, and that is including the 51 points they scored against Temple, right? Um, 127th in yards per play, which actually genuinely might be the most shocking stat of all to me. Um, rushing offense, they're 95th. I mean, they're, they're, you can, I mean, passing offense, they're 118th. Um, so many stats have come out this, this, this week about how bad the offense is. But I think we wanted to get specific and because two things, the offense isn't doing anything well. They're not running the ball well. They're not passing the ball well. Um, There's nothing down the field. So when you combine that with the immense pressure this offense has to stay on schedule, and that is a very that's a very popular phrase for coaches, right? Stay on Mm -hmm. schedule, which obviously means you know getting positive yards on first down, staying ahead of the chains, right? This offense is struggling so much to do that. And to me, we want to get specific because if you want to look at the causes of OU's offense, it's kind of that, isn't it? It's the amount of drives this season where either the first play of the drive or if they somehow get a first down on that drive, there's no momentum. They're They're not doing anything well. They're not sustaining any kind of momentum. And... And I think you can combine that, which we you can combine that drive killing play data with the fact that this is an OU offense that's converting twenty six percent of its third downs. Yep, it's one hundred thirtieth. So you want to know why? And I, and I don't. I should have looked up what their average third down and yards to go number is. I know it was bad through three games. I haven't looked at it in a while. Um. I gotta imagine it's still bad, and I and it's got to be right because there's so many first downs this season where they're going backwards, right? And, and yeah. so that's honestly if you look no further than how inefficient this offense has been on the easiest play to be efficient on, right? Right. Yep. And that's and that just kind of it all compounds on itself. You know, you have and and some of this goes hand in hand like there's there's cause and effect and all kinds of it's the correlation between having a an inefficient offense and an inexperienced offense i mean you just you have so many guys out there right now that are that just haven't played a lot of football uh, and and it really shows and and i think on top of that when you look at the fact that oklahoma is like right near dead last in explosive plays in college football. Um, I mean, that, that explains a lot of it. That explains so much when you, when you, when you don't have the ability to like, just think about this for a second, the largest gain that Oklahoma had against Texas on offense was 15 yards. All game. When you, when you look at it, from that perspective, well, of course it's difficult to have. Like, I mean, one, you're not forcing a defense to cover the field. You're forcing them to cover, you know, 10 yards, 15 yards at most. You don't really have safeties that are worried about getting beat deep. Everybody's able to come up and play a part in the run fit. Um, and then you look at it from a broader perspective, like if you do get in a situation where you're in third and eight or third and 
and 15, I mean, you might as well just trot the punter out there. You, you don't have, you don't have the means or at least to this point, you haven't had the means of, of converting something like that. So, uh, it's really, it's got to be frustrating. And that's the thing. Uh, and I'm sure that we will, we'll talk more about this in a bit, but the going back and watching, uh, some of the games in hindsight, going back, uh, and, and taking a look at what Oklahoma is doing, uh, on offense, there are opportunities to be had. Um, and there are plays that, if made, not only change the outlook of the entire game, but it changes the outlook of of what Oklahoma's offense looks like. And the, and that's what's that's what's got to be frustrating when you if you're the coaching staff and you get in on Sunday morning after getting beat the way you did last week. I have to imagine that there's not a lot of smiles uh, going through film because there's just there there are opportunities there and Oklahoma just hasn't made any of them like they just haven't taken advantage of any of them well and I'll say and this goes into um, a couple of things to go along with what you just brought up so I thought I thought Tuesday's press conference with Brent Venables which I, I saw a lot of different takes about everything he had to say so I'm just going to give you mine as someone who was sitting in the room that asked Brent Venables a question. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought Tuesday was not only the most Brent Venables has talked about the offense ever, but to me it was, I think it's, it's, it's the most candid he's ever been about the offense in two and a half years being, being the team's head coach. And it was refreshing in some ways because, and you mentioned it on Saturday, maybe the most alarming thing that Brent Venable said on Saturday was that he was most concerned about the defense, which is, to me, kind of a gut punch if you're a fan because the defense, was the defense great on Saturday? No. But it, it was wasn't really great. Good for but it was pretty quarters. good. Yeah. Outside it was pretty good. Quarter, yeah. And that second quarter only happened, or not only, but primarily happened because the offense imploded. Correct. And yeah, they missed some tackles, but th that also goes along with what you and I talked about, which is that I think one thing that doesn't get talked enough about when it comes to football is it's so easy to get focused on scheme and X's and O's and strategy that you forget the human element of football. And I cannot imagine what it's been like to be this defense knowing you've got to come up with a turnover or score to give your team any chance to win. Um, anyways, that's an aside. Um, that was concerning to hear Brent Venable say that, bar none, because that sounds like a defensive coordinator talking, not the head coach. Yep. And you were the one that kind of raised the most alarm bells about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it feels... It feels um, that's tone deaf. I mean, yeah. like, that, that's that sounds maybe a little bit harsh, but the, it's the truth. If you, if you honestly, if you look at that game, just like remove yourself from the sideline. If, if you were watching that game on television and you came away with the defense was the problem at the end of that game. I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I, I mean, that's, we're just not watching the same football game because 30, yeah, 34 points, giving up 34 points to Texas, or, yeah, giving up 34 points to Texas, that that's tough. But scoring three points against Texas? You, mm. you give up 13 yards and no first downs in the first quarter. What else, I mean, and you get a turnover. Yep. Uh, what else are you supposed to do? That's when the game was lost. That yeah. that That is when going back, going back and watching that, just having – an average offense. I mean, let's just say they score a touchdown on one of the drives. Yeah, if you're up 10 nothing. Like, yeah. Like 10 nothing, 13 nothing. Like you you should that game looks totally different. Yeah. I don't know that Oklahoma wins, but it's not the blowout that it was. Um yeah, it well, it's concerning. Well, I I mentioned that to say I think it was refreshing to hear some of what Brent said on Tuesday, given that not only is the offense a clear issue here, 
Um, mm-hmm. But that he also made that comment on Saturday. I mean, his entire nine and a half minute opening statement was about the offense. He really only answered questions about the offense. And Brian, he kind of said the same thing you did a second ago, which is, look, is anything about this offense good right now? No, um, it's not. They don't. They they can't run the ball. They can't pass the ball. Um, the offensive line has been at best incredibly inconsistent. Um, injuries absolutely play a factor. Um, but if you go back and watch the tape, and you said this, there were some opportunities to be made. Yep. And that's what Brent said. And I mean, you can't get without him going boring you to death with X's and O's he pretty much diagnosed all of the issues on Tuesday. And that was one of the things he said was there's not very many opportunities, but Mm -hmm. it's not like there are none. So this all comes kind of to a a crash, right? Because there's not very many opportunities, but there are, which means the few opportunities you get, you have to capitalize on them. And OU isn't capitalizing on them. And on top of that, they're they're so inefficient on first on like everything about this offense is just limiting itself both in terms of the fundamental things that go into the offense yes. and the execution of the offense yes like every everything about this offense is so incredibly inefficient almost historically so but for Oklahoma me, yes it is yes. absolutely historic i mean across i mean across the country kind of is um yeah. but talking about drive killing plays and like there is so much, I think you can see the pressure in Michael Hawkins. And I think that's part of the missed opportunities too. Like Mm -hmm. think about everything that's going through a true freshman's head. There's so many times where you hand the ball off on first down and it goes nowhere or uh, you go to run a play and it gets blown up and you're being told presumably don't throw the, don't turn the ball over make smart plays like and i just to me like all and you can't get behind the sticks you can't get behind schedule because if you get behind schedule as your research proves it's a death sentence right and you're putting all of this weight on a true freshman quarterback yeah so like i almost can't blame him for not for missing opportunities because no true freshman quarterback playing in the program's first season in the sec should have to be what should have to be dealing with this much weight that doesn't mean he's immune to criticism at all no but let's let's put ourselves let's put ourselves in his shoes for two seconds why don't i mean you just you you just play superman essentially against auburn win that football game um have yourself a a pretty a, a pretty big performance as a true freshman on the road um you go into the bye week, and from everything that we understand, the offensive scheme changes, which we saw. Uh, I mean, they they truly changed up pretty much everything about the offense. So to me, as a true freshman, the guy gets on campus in January. He's learning one offense, learning one playbook, and goes through spring, goes through fall camp, and runs this this one particular set of plays. This is our bread and butter. This is what we're doing. And then that gets flipped on its head whenever he becomes a starter. You are pretty much installing a new offense in the bye week. And then, oh yeah, by the way, you're playing against number one Texas as your first game um, in the Cotton Bowl. A game that he's familiar with, him being from the Dallas area. Yeah. Uh, okay, all of the pressures that you just added to that, he and I, I will say, I mean, he cerebral. He he is he is one of the the most cerebral freshman quarterbacks that I can remember. I mean, he he processes things quickly, uh, or at least he did uh, whenever he was running the offense he was familiar with. Um, you could really tell, like the the trigger wasn't there, uh, and and when he does pull the trigger, I mean, God, he has velocity on the ball. It, it, you can really see it over some of those throws over the middle that he makes in tight coverage. He can really place a ball where he wants to, and it gets there in a hurry. The problem is we saw him double-taking a lot. We saw him making plays that, 
you just don't see from him on on film. Like the the one that continues to just show up, and there's actually a couple of them in the game where he's behind the sticks and he's rolling out, and instead of throwing the ball out of bounds once he's outside the the tackle box, he just runs out of bounds and loses two or three yards. Yeah, like. I mean, th- th- those simple plays again that piles up. That's, well, and then throw, like, throwing the ball away on fourth down. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can really tell that he's just he's he's stretched so thin trying to figure out how am I going to move us down the field, and there's really not a lot of help around him either. <laughs> so it, yeah. It's well, tough. Uh, well, and this gets into a discussion, and I kind of wanted because we're talking about scheme and, and look, this isn't about overreacting to one loss as bad as that one loss was. And as bad as the offense was, Yeah, we did not learn anything new about this offense. Everything they struggled with on Saturday is exactly the things they have been struggling with the entire season. And that includes temple. Yes. Mm -hmm. They scored 51 points. Those, the symptoms of these issues were there against temple. Absolutely. So it's not about overreacting to one loss. It's like, all of the issues that have been plaguing OU all year came to a head on Saturday in such a embarrassing, horrific fashion. Um, we're talking about scheme, and we're talking about Hawkins feeling like he's got the weight of the world on his shoulders. This was one thing. So, I in part in my mailbag, one of the OU Insider subscribers brought up a really good point, which is. Uh, so they asked, what is your take on the plays being called? It doesn't seem like we run things to set up other things like an offense should. We should be stacking plays. How can we not ever scheme someone open? That, to me, is actually the biggest problem with this offense, is it just seems so discombobulated. Like, mm. when you watch Steve Sarkeesian, when you watch Texas's offense... Yeah. There is a clear, if you go, if you watch their, if you read their drive charts, play by play, mm-hmm. if you watch the film, you can see a through line in everything he's doing. Correct. What this play call leads to this play call leads to this play call. And it's not just about chaining play calls together. It's also, we're making this play call because we want X player in this position because we like this matchup, right? We, we like, we have watched the film and OU's defense is vulnerable here and here. And the best way to exploit that is to run this play involving these players, right? Like it yep. sounds like a very basic fundamental thing, right? Sure. Yeah. When I watch OU's offense and when I've watched them all year, to me, and it, that Texas game was maybe the biggest example of it. It just seems like a collection of plays selected it. No, for no particular reason, and then called with no particular specific yeah. purpose as to why that play call was called in that situation, or the goal of that play isn't clear. It's not clear to a viewer, and it doesn't look like it's clear to the players. Like when you watch Texas, it's clear that 98% of the time, Everybody is on the same page. They understand the purpose of the play call. They understand what they're trying to do. They've been coached that way all week. When mm-hmm. I what I watched on Saturday, Brian, looked like the offense, the the players on the field. Th- yeah, they may know what their responsibility is on that play, although the execution is obviously a concern even in those mm-hmm. plays. Mm-hmm. But it seems like they are almost meandering like. Purpose, purpose, purposelessly. Yeah, there's no philosophy to it. Right. Yeah. And even Jeff Levy, who love him or hate him, and there's a lot of concerns you can throw about his play calling specifically in late game situations. You can't argue like he has a philosophy and the play calling is yeah. consistent with that philosophy and you know exactly what he's trying to do. Right. For hell, come hell or high water, you know what Jeff Levy's trying to do. He's trying to his his whole offense is based on RPOs and running so up tempo to get the defense off balance. What is OU's offense through six weeks? What is like the identity or purpose of this offense? Yeah. And some yeah. of it's hard, right? Because you you sure. benched your starting, you bench you changed yeah. quarterbacks. Yeah, yeah. And you've got injuries. But what is OU trying to execute? So uh, I, I want to build on that, what you just asked, because I, I think, so we've known this, uh, this, this injury bug issue at the wide receiver position at, at uh, along the offensive line. 
it's been an issue through all six games. Like it's been an issue to some extent or another. Um, I think you run out of excuses after like three games. To me, I mean, like, uh, yes, your your jump in competition once you hit the SEC is a lot. Uh, that, that's quite a tall task. But to me, you're six games through the season. You have who you have. So play to their strengths. Like call 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 the call the place to their strengths. The, the offensive line that played is the offensive line they wanted the last two Correct. games. It is absolutely it is hundred percent. And and that's and again I made this point during the uh, during the post game podcast. But it, like you're not throwing scrubs or walk ons out there at wide receiver either. Every one of those guys that played that logged a snap for Oklahoma at wide receiver is a former four star. All of them. Mm-hmm. So they have ability. They were they were recruited by programs around the country. It's not like you're you're just you're shorthanded on guys that can go out there run and catch the ball, and so I agree with you. The it does feel like there is no there's no rhythm, there's no philosophy to what's being called. Part of that, I I, I have to wonder if that's just it, part of that has to be the just a a lack of confidence in who's out there. I, I would imagine, like you know, you're you're just kind of wondering what you're gonna get. And and some of that is inconsistency. I think a lot of that has to do with with the offensive line. I think you're just right now you don't know what you're going to get play to play, and that's that's got to be frustrating. I mean, I one of the most one of the most consistent players along that offensive line all season has been Michael Tarquin, and he got pulled. Like, I mean, Branson I, Hickman I think, got pulled. Yeah, like so you had you have some just questionable things going on on that side of the ball, but I, I think. As as big an issue as the the play calling is, and I do absolutely believe it's an issue, um, especially with the philosophy in it. Uh, w- and, and when somebody when a, when somebody is asking from a fan perspective, why why do we call plays the way that we do? Um, that that was never like you at least <laughs> you at least had fans getting pissed off about. Uh, jet sweeps or uh like gt counter whenever lincoln riley was called like you would see that so often like you would get you would get upset about repeated play calls um but at least that was like you knew that was their bread and butter like you knew that that's what they were going to go to that's what they build their entire scheme around like that's the stem on which everything that they do is built off of so right uh, with with this i don't even know like i honestly don't know what your I don't know what your base play is in the, in this last game that we just watched. I don't know what your base play is of your offense. I have no idea. Is it the sprint draw counter action? Whatever. I mean, whatever that is, is that what we're going to build the offense off of? And if so, why are there not more rollouts built off of it? Why is there not actual sprint outs built off of it? Why aren't we seeing like, it just doesn't make any sense. It really truly is like just this, abomination frankenstein monster of an offense like uh, you just throw everything together and see what works and i well in in all six games there are instances and against texas where javante barnes had a couple of good runs and gavin sawchuk had a couple of good runs but you not only like almost never see those plays called again but you don't see anything called based off the success of that play right like you never see anything that's like oh we did that well what if we do this off of it or let's just do it again (laughs) yeah let's just do it again hey let's run outside zone and then run a play action off of it that looks like the same thing yeah like i right yeah there's not any of that and then Um, well in those those fundamental issues are there and then you add on to it brent talked about it yesterday like Route running has been inconsistent. That's been a problem. But there are plays where there are guys open. Absolutely. But if you're but if you're Michael Hawkins, like I, I don't you're cl- like he's clearly being I'm s I don't I guess I shouldn't say that definitively. It seems pretty apparent he's been coached not to turn the ball over. So you're inherently going to be risk adverse. And when there's not consistency in route running. And there's not consistency in terms of execution. Like it's all, yeah. It's just a jumbled mess of yeah. uh, right. 
what, right. so what were you going to say? Well, you know, I, I think you also have to look at it from a perspective of, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll try and put this up on the screen. Cause this, to me, this makes sense. You have to also remember the two losses that you have. Uh, now Tennessee's lost a game since then. Um, and didn't look great, uh, last week, but, you can see over here, or sorry, on this side, the check marks are those, are the plays that the uh, the drive killing plays on first down, right? This is against Tennessee. This is against Texas down here. So you have, you're playing good defenses. Um, yeah. Which, love it or hate it, like that's going to play a factor in how, how efficient you are. Um, but I also think play calling aside, you're just not efficient. You're not running th- things efficiently either as, as the play, as the, uh, the players out there, um, you know, FPI is, is kind of, you know, some people like it. Some people hate it. Um, I do like some of the efficiency stuff that they use that ESPN uses. And this really like th- th- this, this really hurts. <laughs> Defensively, Oklahoma ranks ninth nationally in efficiency. Special teams, they rank ninth nationally in efficiency. Shout out Luke Elzinga, who's been the best player on this team through six weeks. Correct. Yep. Offensively, 104th. That's almost higher than I, than I thought it would right. have been. Right. And, so, and that's bad. Yeah. yeah. And that's bad. And so... In terms of overall efficiency, Oklahoma ranks 44th in all uh, by all teams, and that's because their offense is just. I mean, if you had, we had this discussion on the way home from Dallas. If you had a mediocre 60, 60th best offense in, in college football, you're a top 10 team. Like you're a top 10 team in efficiency because your other two, the other two sides of the football are playing so well. But um, well, yeah, and I. It's, it's, I said this on a pod a couple weeks ago. There, the gap between where this offense is now and becoming average is so wide. Yep. I think I said that after the Tennessee game. You did. Like, at some point, you kind of had like this. I don't think this offense is going to become average. And imagine no. what it would be, what this team would be if this was an average offense. Right. If they were 70th best at everything. You're probably 5-1 and one and have a respectable loss to Texas, I would think. Um, or maybe not like maybe that was enough to the opportunities you had in the first quarter. (laughs) Yeah. It's a, what if game and it's frustrating. It's gotta be. And if it's this frustrating for us, you know, it has to be frustrating for that staff. Like. uh, mm. So let's. God, there's so many things we could talk about with how bad this offense has been. Let's, let's talk about what this means moving forward. Because here's the reality. OU is still 4-2, and two, which is mm-hmm. not horrific. Um, but they still have six games to play, man. They still yes, have they five games to play against SEC teams that are not going to be easy, and that includes this weekend. Yep. Anybody, I don't think anybody thinks Oklahoma's just going to pounce South Carolina, but anybody that's chalking this up as a guaranteed win, it's not. Oh, no. South Carolina could come in and beat the doors off Oklahoma this weekend. Absolutely, yeah. Could I happen. would, I would say that that's more likely than the than the than the other way around. The other way around, yeah, yeah. So the one topic that, and Parker and I only barely got to touch on it in quick slants, um, but I mean I, Barry Trammell from the Tulsa World asked Brent yesterday about his philosophy on midseason changes, which we knew he told us he was going to ask us that he was going to, he was going to ask Brent mm-hmm. that. So we knew like we were all like kind of on bated breath, like waiting, waiting for, for Barry to ask that question. Um, Brent didn't say yes or no. He just said, it's not, he's never been a part of it and obviously indicated that it's not something on his radar. Because here's the thing, the implicit thing in all of this, and it's not to put a 100% of the blame on him. It's not to put any, it's not to make him a scapegoat. It's, but the implicit thing in everything we're talking about is Seth Luttrell, right? And to a lesser extent, Joe John Finley. Yeah. As bad as it's all been, 
as far as making a mid-season change, it still, to me, does not make the most amount of sense. Nope. It doesn't. And I know that's not going to be what a lot of people want to hear. This isn't about saying... This isn't even about expressing that it's going to get better. Because I don't. I don't have confidence that this is going to get better. Right. This isn't about holding on to some pipe dream on behalf on for Oklahoma fans that, that um, to me, it's just, it's from the simple fact that it makes more sense to do it after the season, as opposed to throwing an already fragile, chaotic situation yep. to even more chaos and fragility. Right. Yeah. Because, and I'm going to, I'm, I want to hear all your thoughts because I have a ton, but, Here's the simple reality of the situation. You know who is the most qualified player or person on that coaching staff to call to call plays at Oklahoma by far? Seth Luttrell. Yeah. Does anybody else on staff have experience calling plays at the Division One level, at the Power Four level? I think they have an analyst, maybe, but I mean on the on the coaching staff. No. Demarco no, Murray, Bill no. Beatenbow. No. Um, Emma Jones. I mean, Joe John Finley helped in the in the Alamo Bowl. In the Alamo Bowl, but to what extent, I have no idea. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why I don't think it makes sense, but almost for the simple fact that, like, Seth Luttrell by far is the most qualified person to call plays on this staff. Right. But I'm curious what because we didn't we only talked a little bit on the drive home, but that's obviously been a discussion that fans are having yeah. is about the, the validity of a mid season fire. Um, I think it's a, I, I think a mid season change is, is an awful idea. Um, uh, reason being is one, you just said it. There's, there's not anybody on that staff, uh, that is qualified to, to do this. Now, I think the most, obvious argument for that is how much worse can it get? It can't get any worse. It's been terrible. Um, yeah, it can. Yes, it can. It absolutely can. Yes, it can. can. Yes, it can. Um, and, and I think that's the, that, that is, that's the game that you play. If, if you do that, you, you risk throwing something that's already been terrible into like further anarchy. Like it's been, it's been bad. And I, I think that, when you look at who Oklahoma has on its staff, I, I, I think there are plenty of guys there that have high upside, um, as, as play callers in the future, maybe if they want to be, but do you really want to do that with, <laughs> this is going to sound wrong. It probably it's this is probably going to sound bad, but I'm going to just say it anyways. If, if it was, if it was Baylor, Texas Tech, Houston, TCU left on the schedule. Okay, yeah, you see what you can do. Like, you've got some t- teams that you should be able to hang with or beat. You should be more talented than go for it. It's not the case. Not the case here. You've got South Carolina this week, who is your, I mean, on paper, your easiest. Uh, game left in SEC play, and then you've got Ole Miss on the road, you've got Mizzou on the road, you've got Bama coming to Norman, and then you've got LSU on the road. That's rough, and that is not some, like, you are not setting yourself up for success as a staff or a team if you are throwing a first-time play caller into that gauntlet. That makes no sense. Now, again, I want to say, I, I want to reiterate, if it does not get better, if things don't improve drastically for this Oklahoma offense as the season rolls along, absolutely there is probably a change coming. Like, yes, yes. You you, you cannot, um, and you know I'm I'm not going to say that there won't be a change coming uh, mid season if Oklahoma goes out and loses another game like they just did. If, I, if, have, if, I, I I would be really that would put an immense amount of pressure on. The athletic staff as a whole. Um, that that is yes. That's like the one caveat to all of this is if they go if they go this weekend and get beat by 
multiple touchdowns and the offense looks just as inept, Mm -hmm. then yes, I honestly think at that point, you maybe start having a discussion, right? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And the mid, go ahead, go ahead. The, the, the big thing here is, and this is, this is going to happen every year and this is going to happen for Oklahoma when it's positive as well as negative. We saw it last year. Um, on the positive side of things, the OU Texas game, the outcome of that game, the everything's magnified. And it's always like after you beat Texas last year, you trailed most of the second half. And then you, you, you end up winning that game at the end. Um, you immediately crown Oklahoma as a national championship contender, right? Like you, you see that happen. Well, this year, it's the opposite effect, but it's still, it's magnified because it was against Texas. That rivalry is huge. Both programs, whether Brent Venables wants to admit it or not, both fan bases of those two programs, they compare one, they compare to one another like that. That's you have to, how you look in that game is, is probably more important to most fans than, than most would believe that game is that important. Um, and so making a decision based off that game alone is not it, it wouldn't be wise however i think because it happened in that game the noise is already louder than it would have ever been otherwise like because the worst offensive performance of the season was in that game um yeah the fire got started a lot faster so it's it's tough um i i think if you would have scored a few touchdowns in that game and it looks respectable like then it probably isn't nearly as as hot going into this week but you didn't and uh it was a really good team it was a really good defense probably the best defense you're going to see the rest of the way and you just have to hope that things look better if you're Seth Luttrell what this comes down to is you cannot make a decision rashly you cannot make an you cannot make a reactive decision yep. um if you're Brent Venables right now more than ever and if yep. you make a decision like that you have to weigh it from every perspective you have to weigh the the effect it's going to have on this year's team you have to weigh the effect that it's potentially going to have uh, on the player or in terms uh, on this year's team in terms of success can you point to something to say if we make this move we think we can be better because of X, Y, and Z. So you right. have to weigh it from that factor. You have to weigh it from what is the impact of a midseason firing going to have on the players currently on the roster? Are we thinking we're going to save some players from entering the portal? Are we thinking it's going to potentially lead to players entering the portal? Then you have to think about it from the recruiting class. How What impact does it have on the recruiting class? Mm. You have to think about it from the terms of your, your long-term viability in your new conference. This is year one in the SEC. This isn't year five. This is year one. Not to mention, this is year one for Seth Luttrell as the offensive coordinator. Mm. This And none of this, is, none of this is even factoring in the fact that Seth Luttrell is making a ton of money in the first year of his contract. So then you have to factor in the buyout of it. And then the number one thing you have to ask yourself with any coaching changes or coaching decision is who are you getting to replace him? Right. Right now, right now you're not hiring anybody. No, right now you're promoting someone on the staff, right? Then what are you doing in the off season? Yep. That's where I think it is important to regardless of how the rest of the season goes for Oklahoma. Uh, and unless they just start scoring 40 points a game, which isn't going to happen, like not going to happen. Um, there might be better, there might be better options out there from a fan perspective. Like Brandon Marion's going to be the guy that everybody talks about. Um, would that pairing fit with Oklahoma? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it might, that might be, a, a really good thing, but you just don't know until you get there and you can't base it off of as much as, as much as Oklahoma fans want to base it off of six games. Um, what I, what I think is, is tough about this situation or any coaching situation is 
nobody knows what it looks like on that practice field. You have 20 hours a week with those guys uh, prior to game day. And in those 20 hours, I mean, we heard we heard that some of the practices they had last week leading up to the Texas game were, were great, that they had some of the best practices they've had all season. Brent talked um, about that. Yeah. Oh, like, I mean, it's – It's one thing to see it in practice. That's what you're expected to base your decisions off of. That's what you base your who's playing, what you're calling, all of that stuff. And then when you get into the game and it doesn't work because nobody uh, can effectively just, you know, execute it, like that's that's not Latrell's fault. That part of it's not Latrell's fault. Now, again, there's so much blame to go around in this, like, you're you're muted. You're muted. Keep doing that. It is never as simple as just saying it's the offensive coordinator's fault, right? And in, in, in a situation this fundamentally broken mm-hmm. and this fundamentally inefficient, you can't just. It's not just right. Latrell. It's not. Yeah. It, yeah. Absolutely. Well, like you know. Sure. Okay. Let's let's say we don't like the way that we don't. There's no rhythm to the to the play calling. Okay. Give you that. I also don't believe that the rotation at running back has been copacetic for the offense. Like I, I don't like, I don't, I don't think that it's, and that that's again, that's my opinion, but um, it's a pretty popular opinion among the fan base. It seems that it's just the, there's questions about it, but you, you don't go and get rid of the running back coach that just landed the number one running back in the class uh, last year and has proven he's been able to bring in some of the top talent. Now, we haven't seen some of those guys necessarily just been able to take the cap off of a defense, but how much of that is their fault and how much of that's the offensive line? Like, right. I mean, it's well, tough. And it's, well, and it's, that's, it's, that's when it starts getting in, into player evaluation even, right? Because this is the offensive line, which I'm not saying they didn't, they didn't get literally everybody they wanted. Cause it doesn't work that way, sure. but this is the group they wanted. Yeah. This is the group beating bow and the now, coaching staff wanted. I will. I had a conversation this week with somebody that this is to me, it makes a lot of sense. If, if Caden Green and Andrew Rame were plugged into that offense right now, I think the offensive line looks, I mean, I, I would say it's a good group. That's not, but the, the reason being is everybody else that you have there provides depth. You have credible depth at that point. Um, guys that know what they're doing have been there and done it. It would look a lot different because you can play guys where you want to uh, and experience guys at that. And right now, they just, I mean, it's its just been bad. And they've only played, again, you have to look at it from a perspective of you're basing this off of, a, uh, of an offensive line that's played two weeks together against Auburn and Texas. So, yes. I mean... I- I I think the discouraging thing, and I think this is the best way I could put it, is there are a lot of things you can point to as to not only why this isn't working, why this hasn't been successful through six weeks, and why it could have been predicted that this would happen. Not to this extent. I don't think anybody could have seen this coming. No. Um, I mean, I said OU would go 9-3. and That is on the record. I said they'd go 9-3. and And part of that was because not only did they lose so many guys from a year ago, not to mention Dylan Gabriel, they lost so many guys from a year ago, but you're entering year one in a new conference, a lot of unfamiliarity, blah, 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 right? Hmm. I think this is the disheartening thing, is that as much as you can point to a lot of legitimate reasons why OU is struggling, it's hard not to look at what Texas is doing right now, man, in year four under Sark, and that program did what you kind of think it would, right? Year one, and we talked about this on the way back. Year one, small dip, right? And then, yep. Skyrockets. And not only skyrockets, but Sark looks like he's for an, I mean, he's an offensive guy and he's still the play caller. That defense looks pretty, pretty damn nasty, man. Um, And they're in the first year in the SEC, too. Now they haven't played. I mean, we're going to find out a lot about Texas this weekend against Georgia, but. This, I mean, and Oklahoma had even more. I mean, because I mean, they went all the chaos that came from Lincoln Riley to Brent Venables and all of the changes that have come from that. Kale Gundy's firing, right? A lot of crazy stuff. Yeah. 
Not like Texas was winning championships in the 2010s. No. They were they were going 5 and 7, 6 and yep. 6, 7 and 5. And Sark within 4 years has taken that program to the college football playoff, looks even better this year and yep. looks like it is sustainable. Yep. It's hard, right? I mean, yeah. you mentioned everything gets elevated after OU Texas. It That's does. a bigger stage, but Oklahoma didn't look like they belong on the same field with them, man. And I don't know how much the injuries would have really... How much is it making up the gap? It just looks like from top to bottom, that's probably the hardest thing for OU fans to swallow, right? Right. Well, and, you know, I I think that thing, that thing avalanched on you um, if you're Oklahoma. Like, it was... I don't even remember what the score was at the end of the third quarter. 21 to three, I think still. Yeah, there wasn't any points scored in the third quarter, I don't think. Or maybe there was a field goal. Anyways, the thing really avalanches on you, and then they they tack on some points there at the end, too. Um, I think I've heard it said by several people, um, Oklahoma's defense is SEC ready. Yes, it is. Uh, Brent Venables has rebuilt the defense. It's yeah, rebuilt. it's it's ready. Um, the special teams has been SEC ready. Like, I mean, they, they've Luke Elzinga's looked great. Um, you know, I I think you've had a couple of guys and uh, you know hit some big kicks already this year. The offense is just it's just so discombobulated. Um, I think you put a lot of eggs in the basket of expecting Jackson Arnold to be the guy, like. I mean, t- t- take yourself a month and a half back, and uh, he was on the board for Heisman odds. You know, people were wondering, you know, was he going to be SEC Newcomer of the Year? Like, could he, um, could he be like the next guy in this line, in this long line of great Oklahoma quarterbacks? Like, you just throw it out there, and it was a possibility. Um, and that narrative has changed. I mean. It's it's flipped on its head now. It's different. It's totally different. So, I, let's yeah. Let's, it's 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 frustrating. Um, and and when you compare it to Texas, especially with the trajectory, I mean, yeah, they're 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 one play away from playing for a national championship last year. And I don't know if they, I don't know if they don't match up with Michigan better than Washington did. Um, you know, I I hate to say it that way, but they they they're, this I, they should be Washington. Yeah, like this is a. This is a, a a program that is headed in the right in the right direction, and uh, I mean Oklahoma is just it's a it's a really frustrating situation for Sooner fans because you are you you do have this expectation and this uh, standard that Oklahoma is supposed to live up to. Um, I mean they're one of those four or five Mount Rushmore programs in the country for football, and right now you just don't look anything like it. And uh, until you get this thing figured out on offense, you won't <laughs> because Let's, the schedule doesn't get any easier. I, I put this into perspective because somebody asked um, somebody in my mail in the mailbag said, I thought defense won championships. Boy, am I wrong? And I understand the sentiment. I absolutely I understand the sentiment. Here's the reality. I, so I took a look at the last six national championship teams. All of them ranked in the top 14 nationally in offense and defense. All of them, except LSU, who ranked third in 2019, who ranked 32nd in defense. So the defense was just good instead of amazing, right? And you know, they had, and their offense was first. (laughs) Yeah. So, and I, so Brent Venables has been tasked not only with rebuilding the defense, but he's been re- he has been tasked with getting OU over the mountaintop, something that Lincoln Riley could not do. Right? The defense part, the defensive part of that is mostly completed. The defense has gotten to where it needs to be. Problem is, the stats are clear, man. Your offense can't just be good. It can't just be great. It's got to be elite. Yep. I mean, those Alabama teams, those Georgia teams. LSU Clemson in 2018 with Brent Venables on staff. That defense was first in the country. That was a top 15 offense. Mm -hmm. To win the national championship, you have to have an elite offense. And this offense is so far from elite. It is miles and miles from elite. And then I think to flip it, 
Lincoln Riley's philosophy has issues, has downsides, but it it felt a lot better to be close to be away from the mountaintop, but win ten or more games and be in playoff contention every yes. year. Um, That's not to say. I want real quick. I want to make that very clear. I'm not saying it could not be that Lincoln Riley. That is not an excuse for Lincoln Riley. That is not praise of Lincoln Riley. There are clear and obvious downsides to what he does. I'm just saying from a feeling aspect, elite offenses that have you in a game every year or every week feels better than a horrible offense with a good defense, even if neither style gets you to the top of the mountaintop. Well, right. Yeah. And I think, I think you and I had this discussion on the way home. Uh, from Dallas, and maybe it was with Parker. I had a discussion with somebody on our staff. Um, that style of football in today's game, uh, offensive, you know, being an offensive juggernaut versus a defensive one, it, it, what it does is that will get you in the door of the elite, and then and then you'll get your you'll get the brakes beat off. Get your of ass you. kicked. Yeah, because you you don't you don't belong. You don't have the defense there, and that's where defense does win championships. Is when you get to that elite level and you're playing another team um, that got there because they have an elite offense and an elite defense. You you stick out like a sore thumb. Um, when you don't have when you have a bad offense, you are prone to a slog like we saw last weekend. Um, the you're, I I tripped up on this word too last time. Um, your margin of error in uh in those games dwindles significantly whenever you have a bad offense because you don't you just when you control the ball you've got to put points up. That's how this game works. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's great having a good defense. Um, but eventually what you run into. And I think this is a worry of a lot of the fan base, and it should be, is at what point, not that I think the defense is just going to turn things in, like that's that's not what I'm worried about, but at what point does it wear that side of the ball down where a, a defensive unit that looked pretty dominant through the first five games um, doesn't look anything like that at the end of the year uh, you have to have, it's just not a winning formula. Well, I and, mean, and ultimately Lincoln Riley was never going to win a title at Oklahoma because the defenses weren't good enough, right? The offenses were good enough. The defenses weren't now you're Brent Venables at Oklahoma and you've proven you've, you've got the defense rebuilt, but ultimately if Brent Venables wants to be successful at Oklahoma, the offense is going to have to be come elite. And Brent Venables can't just be a bystander in that process. We're going to have to see Brent Venables get more involved and more purposeful because you're not Oklahoma. You are not going to win a title unless you are top 15 in both offense and defense. Right. Well, and that's the thing about losing Jeff Levy. Uh, And that's why that. Okay. This is, this is something that needs to be said. Um, absolutely has to be said because I think this is going to get lost on a lot of fans. Jeff Levy is an elite offensive mind. Like him or not, he is. Like he's proven it. His 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 track record is there. The problem with going out and getting a Brandon Marion or Jimmy Corn or like whoever your your next guy in line is uh, for uh, to to call plays at Oklahoma those guys are going to move on and have opportunities to be head coaches. Yep. When you go out and grab somebody that already has this pedigree of offensive dominance, um, it, that's not going to, it, once you land that job at Oklahoma, your next job opportunity is going to be a head coach somewhere. That's just how it works. You can't build a program when you're changing offenses every two seasons. It doesn't work that way. You can't. You cannot do that. It, it just look at these long-standing 
dynasties where like Nick Saban is, and I hate this, but he's the exception because that guy, I mean, he's, he's just, he's the best. He's the best that's ever done it. Um, you, you have these offensive philosophies and coaching staffs that for the most part stick together year after year. Uh, and it's really important when you are building the program, not just sustaining it, but when you're building the program, it's important to have that cohesion. And so that I understand where, um, hiring somebody for the sake of cohesion is like, it makes sense. You have to you have to have some of that to get things going. Unfortunately, I think the question being asked right now is, is that the right fit? Like, is that the guy that's going to get you to that mountaintop? And I right now it doesn't look like it. Um, and it's 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 a tough spot to be in. And I, I think that's what's difficult for Oklahoma fans. And what really sucks is you have last year's offense with this year's defense. And yeah, you're right where you want to be. You you are right there. And for one reason or another that didn't happen and it's it's got it's got to be frustrating you're so close but i mean oklahoma fans have been listening to you're so close for years now so i don't think that's going to make them feel any better this isn't and the reality is this isn't the big 12 this is the sec and things can start piling really quickly and that 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 uphill battle to not only stay relevant but to succeed and contend that's that hill can start getting steeper and steeper really quickly so that turns the focus honestly brian to this weekend against south carolina and we've and we probably don't have a ton of time to break into that game to break down that game other than um to tell you that i can't think of a game that feels more pressured and with more stakes yeah, this weekend. Yeah. I mean, go through what's on the line. I mean, that one good thing about college football is things can change so diff- so drastically from week to week. And if Oklahoma comes out and the offense looks fine, better, improved, and they win, things will feel a hell of a lot better than they have the last few days and really yeah. the first six weeks. Yeah. They lose and the offense looks bad. I mean... This is a, to me, Brian, and I'm not trying to be hyperbolic because because this isn't a game Oklahoma should win. This is a this is a this is a misleading three and three South Carolina team. This feels like a career defining game for Brent Venables at Oklahoma. Yep, it is. Absolutely, it is. Um, it doesn't have as much. There's not as much anticipation for it as there was for the Tennessee game, but anticipation has nothing to do with it. Importance as for for, for the importance. future of the program. Yes, yes. I 100% agree with you. Um, yeah, there there hasn't been a game during his tenure that has more on the line than this one. It, it is, and that's the nature of the game. That's the nature of of this game after uh after Texas like that that's that's just part of it but i think what you have seen everything all the parts the culmination of everything that we've seen from the first 6 weeks um it all comes together right here and fact of the matter is if you don't beat south carolina at home how in the world do you expect this team to go on the road and win one of its three road games remaining in SEC play or Alabama coming to Norman? Um, I mean, chalk the main game. You're going to win the main game. Like, five wins. You, you've you got five wins. But you're staring. If you don't but win this st- weekend, you're, you're, you're staring five and seven correct. down the barrel. Absolutely you are. And the, you know, going into this game, you you really only have to go off of the SEC opponents that you faced because I, I Auburn's a uh, Auburn's a decent team overall in the scheme of college football, but I I mean I think South Carolina is a better football team than Auburn is from top uh, to bottom. Yeah, I agree. Um, so with that being said, you look at the you look at our drive charts over here with just SEC opponents. Oklahoma's offense 
against SEC opponents. It had 38 offensive drives. You have scored points on eight of those. That's 20%, 21%. You've punted 18 times. That's 47%. You have turned the ball over 11 times, which is 29%. So you are turning the ball over more in SEC play than you are scoring. Uh, you have a drive-killing play 63.2% of the time. 24 of the 38 drives have had a drive-killing play. So this week, case in point, top priority of your offense, you have to stay ahead of the chains and on schedule. Unfortunately, South Carolina has some pretty good pass uh-huh. rushers. I think the hard part is South Carolina is South Carolina's strength, which on that defensive line, that defensive line is really good, is exactly where Oklahoma is vulnerable. Mm. And their weaknesses, which is in the secondary and giving up some big plays. Something Oklahoma is, hasn't been is able not to where is not where Oklahoma succeeds. Yeah. And that's that's maybe the that's maybe the scariest part of this going in is that they are good in ways that will hurt Oklahoma and they are bad in ways that Oklahoma can't take it or that Oklahoma to this has point not, has not yes. taken advantage of. Yeah. Yeah. That, and you nailed it. Like that's, that's exactly it. Honestly, it, it, uh, it sets up like the Auburn game does for Oklahoma's offense. It's Auburn's strength is, was up front and their secondary was what you really needed to take advantage of. And for most of that game, I mean, hell outside of, one play in that game you didn't um yeah it's it's gonna be a tough game and i i, I think you know I, with the freshman quarterback situation with all of the stuff going on i mean it, Deion burks potentially coming back but we don't know like all of that stuff there are just so many unknowns for this offense and Going into it without an identity into a game of this magnitude is terrifying, but you better make sure you have an identity coming out of this game uh, because if there's been a week of preparation where you are sitting down and trying to define who you are as an offense, it had to have been this week. And if you don't come out of this game with an answer to that, I think the rest of your season is an uphill battle. I agree. And like I said, um, so much can change week to week. And if and if Oklahoma wins this game and their offense looks better, all of a sudden you look at the rest of the schedule and you think, hey, maybe we can win an old, you know, if you're an OU fan, hey, maybe we can win an old miss. Maybe we can win in Missouri. Yeah. If you lose this game at home and it and it's bad, I mean, holy cow, the vibes are gonna get low. The vibes are gonna get lower than I can remember them getting in the 23 years I have followed OU football. That's that's what's at stake here. Mm-hmm. And the rea- and the last thing I'll say is fair or not and Brent's had to deal with he's had to corral a lot of chickens since he since he came back to Norman. He had his mulligan year. That was 22. Yep. You got the 1 6 and 7 year. You can't you can't do that again. Not not in year three and not in the first year of the SEC. Not with Texas ascending. And I know Brent said he wasn't sure if Texas success, if their success affects Oklahoma. It does. Absolutely, it does. And you it just it's catastrophic. If you lose and I'm not saying look, I'm you still you're still gonna have games to play after this weekend, obviously. I'm not saying if they lose this weekend, they're automatically gonna lose out, but all of this is to say you're staring at the you're staring at catastrophe if you lose this weekend. Yep, you are. God, we talked for over an hour and I feel like there's still a billion things we didn't get to so and a billion to things we could talk still. to. Yeah. But the good news is we've still got plenty of content pumping out over at OUinsider.com, including your drive killing piece that'll officially come out on Friday. Uh, everybody out there needs to go check that out. Um, I'll have another piece of my mailbag come out later today or early tomorrow. In addition to some other content, Parker published a story about the young guys needing to step up this weekend. Um, Tons of stuff to look forward to over at OUinsider.com. Make sure you like and subscribe here at the OU Insider YouTube channel to get all of the content here that you're not going to get there. 
And we'll all be, it'll be a full crew, uh, OU Insider crew this weekend against South Carolina, 11.45 a.m. on ESPN, I believe. ESPN? Yes. 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 ESPN. Uh, no, no, no. Sorry. SEC Network. SEC, SEC Network. Yes. 11.45 on the SEC Network. We'll have tons of, better yet, some people can't watch stuff on SEC Network. So, or probably, I don't know how that, all that works. Anyways. Follow along with OU Insider regardless because we're going to have all angles covered from this weekend in a game that feels pretty damn massive. So follow along with us here. Appreciate you guys tuning in as always. Hope this was either therapeutic or helpful in some way. Maybe it just made you angrier. I don't know. Anyways, thanks for tuning in. From Brian and I, appreciate you guys as always. We'll see you back here next week on the Oklahoma Drill.